All right, guys, we got the. This is our astrology cam. This is, <laughs> this is awesome. The, okay, yeah. so I'm actually going to show a couple different. So I'm going to start here, and then I'm going to show y'all something else real quick, just to demonstrate. So this is uh, Michael Kersey's natal chart. This is what the sky looks like at the time of his birth. So at this time, I do use whole sign houses. Uh, at this time. Uh, you had the Jupiter was in Cancer with Chiron there. And actually, let me just double check that I'm using the right type of chart here. Okay, yes, I am. Um, yeah, you've got a lot of Sagittarius. You've got a uh, Sun and Moon in Sagittarius and a Mercury in Sagittarius. Oh, Pluto, Mars, conjunction. All right, so uh, essentially, this is a picture of the sky. And it is like any other 2D projection of the globe. You know, it's, it's a flattened Wait, map. I'm going to start so drinking. Sorry to interrupt you. I'm going to start drinking. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Feel free. Uh, this is a great thing to, to drink to. Yeah. Um, and actually, let me turn off this uh, user-defined point because we don't need that. Oh, uh, chart options, user defined point, edit, and then delete that, and then save, and then select, and okay, there we go, it's gone. Um, okay, so this is what the sky looks like flattened. Now, where the ascendant is, this AS, is the exact degree of the sign that was on the horizon at the time of Michael's birth. And this is, so this line essentially right here, the ascendant and the implied opposite is the horizon. So over here, you have the east. Over here, you have the west. And then I believe this is the south or north. I always forget because it's it's difficult to understand until you've... Yeah, so this is the north and this is the south. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that the earth is on a tilt and the zodiac is inscribed around the ecliptic. So there's not a direct map. So imagine that you are actually facing uh, towards the view. So like you would be lying in the middle of the earth facing outwards because this is essentially a project a flattened projection of the ecliptic uh sphere so or rather the the great sphere that surrounds the earth the celestial sphere now let me show y'all something else which should make this a little bit more concrete hopefully um okay so open this up and then set this to capture Master log. Okay. All right. Can you all see that? Okay. It's a little bit awkward, but I think it, it should work. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So now this is the view that a lot of astrologers don't work with. This is the 3D view of what the world actually is. And it kind of is, is very beautiful and shows the picture. So uh, this is Astrolog, by the way. It's free software for Windows. It's uh, existed since like the 90s, and you can tell. Um, but it's still really useful for this view in particular. This so, is cool as fuck. I love how that looks. Just visually, yeah. I love how it looks. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, and so this right here is essentially you... And then the equator is, where's is the equator? The equator is this purple line right here. And then the ecliptic is what's inscribed around this line, I believe, because most of the planets are on it. And that's where you see these degrees around. So essentially, really the zodiac is right around here. And it's inscribed around this blue line that we see going around. Uh, and then, and you can also see kind of like the top of the Zodiac defined right there. So this is actually the very bottom of the Zodiac if we're looking at it. So let me, uh, I'm just going to do a display capture because I think that'll make it easier to understand. So when we're talking about the East, Wait, we're really on. talking about. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I just have another, oh, you're good. another genius idea for how to rearrange it and it'll all be more impressive okay. if I do so what I'm going to actually do is make you big. Ooh. And make... This is close enough. And then make the uh, plane it, small. Eris, it does make a difference to that the ecliptic is tilted. So based on the rotation of the Earth, as well as your latitudinal or longitudinal location of your birth, it will change uh, what these lines look like. Well, depending on your house system. So there's different ways to divide the sky. And th this is some of the astronomical calculations I'm talking about, where whole signs is a more traditional method from, uh, from the old, old, like medi even before medieval, the Hellenistic era, where each house is 30 degrees exactly. But you can use a house system like Placidus, which this is set to, where 
it's more based on dividing, uh, choosing four angles in the sky or four subdivisions and then further subdividing those. And there's a bunch of different ones and they all have like very mathy explanations uh, that don't matter too much uh, right now. So essentially when I'm talking about the, the ascendant, you know, that's this line right here. Uh, this is whatever point I believe uh, it's the first house line right here because this would be, I believe, the horizon at the time of birth. So this is like essentially the edge of what you'd be able to see. And so east is going, I believe, relative to your perspective, because you have to remember we're facing outwards. So this way is east and this way is westward, I believe. I might be getting that wrong because that's this is always still confusing to look at even after years because, you know, ast astrophysics and astronomy is hard. Um, but essentially the idea is that you know, you're in a actual 3D sphere that is subdivided into all these locations. And so when you look at this, we're really talking about this right here. And so if you were to look at, say, the location of birth straight down and you see, okay, like uh, we've got Mars and Pluto or Mars and the node right there. Uh, and if you look at the actual sign it's in, I believe it is yeah in Gemini right now. So Mars and the node are in Gemini together right there and if we say translated this to by animating this to the just the, the current time will that work yeah you'll see there we go mars and the node right there are in the sign of gemini so yeah it works um okay so that that's the main thing i wanted to show so let me switch back to the astro charts and then we'll actually look at what some of this stuff means so uh, maybe saying it takes a shitload of time to learn everything there is to know about um, astrology, and I'm guessing that part of that is just actual like astronomy. Like you got to mm -hmm. right, yeah, beyond yeah. You have... interpretive stuff and beyond like all that. you can learn to look at a natal chart and just like read it abstractly, read the planets, read the signs, read all that stuff. But what I've personally found is that if you really want to learn astrology and and some of the key ideas in it you have to know the astronomy as well like you have to understand a lot of the details about how this stuff works on a mechanical level because this is actually goes to my point about the astrology meets the astronomy in the middle you know we don't make our own stuff up it's all based off the symbolic uh ideas and explanations of astronomical movements or positions or orientations or what have you uh, anyways i know i'm super big right now so let me put this <laughs> other view up sure um just one second this one no this one and then hidden okay cool awesome uh oh wait not awesome not yet now awesome okay can you all see that okay it looks good all right perfect so this is michael kersey's natal chart so what we've got here and, and i'll kind of just go through the way i would interpret this normally is you have the sun and moon in a sagittarius so let me actually back up first and start and say most people understand that they have a sun sign. You know, they know that they're born in a certain time of year. I was born in August. Uh, I'm a Leo. Um, Michael was born in whatever range Sagittarius is, and he's a Sagittarius. And that's all we know. And we often hear like, oh, you know, this, you don't have a, uh, or I don't relate to my description of my sun sign. And a lot of the time, the reason for that is, well, basically all the time, is that you don't have just a sun sign. You have a sign for every single planet that exists, and you can also try and create interpretations for them. Uh, I saw a question about Pluto as well. We do include Pluto. We don't care whether it's um, noted as a dwarf planet or a literal planet. Like That's all just categorization, and what we pay attention to is the meanings and correlations to when it appears. But So the sun is a sign that typically represents like your personal identity it's kind of like your mission in life it's what you end up doing and it often will show itself through the personality but there are other planets in my opinion that do are more indicative of you know your actual personality as well uh so a sun in sagittarius sagittarius is a sign that is very uh truth seeking it is all about uh you know finding a mission or a quest uh, i often 
relate them in my head to kind of like you know knights of uh you know like the the templar or something like that like somebody who's going out to try and find a holy grail sort of mission uh they are also very fun loving they're very uh expressive they often cannot control what they say like they they are compulsive truth speakers uh they often uh stick their feet in their own mouths as a result because they don't know how to like not just say what's on their mind uh and then yeah it's also literally the sign of philosophy it is the sign of uh all things of like higher learning deep pursuits and education things like that also a love of actually uh international travel uh long <laughs> travel like flights <laughs> things like that like honestly this couldn't be any more perfect and it, it's almost always like this wait, wait. So, um, oh, oh, so, so wait, wait. Yeah. you you were just saying the what sign is that sagittarius oh yeah. just sagittarius so you, full stop yeah. okay yeah yeah sagittarius so like you have three planets in sagittarius so that's all very significant like that means Sagittarius will show up very strongly in your personality. Yep, they they love uh, they love freedom. They don't want to be tied down. Things like that. Uh, so then we would move on to your ascendant. Uh, some people might start with it, but the ascendant. The idea is the sign that was on the horizon at the time of your first birth. So if you are a C-section, it's at the first time you took a breath on. Unassisted, using your own lungs. Lungs, you weren't using the umbilical cord. And if you were just a natural birth, or you know, I don't know, test tube baby, or whatever, whenever you first took a breath, is your your birth. And the idea is that the sign has a, I guess, energetic component to it, or whatever you want to call it. Then, and, and whenever I I say this means that, just read it as this has a correlation to this. Like this mm -hmm. is what we've observed. Um, and so the ascendant in Virgo often will tend to be somebody who is like uh, often has a, has a distinct style of either fashion or like collection or like a, like a curatorial sort of edge that will tend to um, be, be finicky about things and, and aesthetics in some way. Um, often Virgo rising will be uh, veering to the to the edge of sometimes like a little bit critical or like very um, detail oriented and very able to kind of like zone in on, on tiny things and really like pull apart the pieces and see how things work, stuff like that. Um, so you'll notice that we have two different sort of descriptions, right? Like Virgo is very different from Sagittarius. Mm -hmm. So you kind of blend them together. Um, and that is the art of reading a natal chart. You look at all these things and you're like, okay, how do these all fit together? Um, so then I would maybe move on to this cluster of Pluto and Mars here together in the third house, which is very interesting because Mars in Scorpio, Mars is the planet that's associated with activity, action, initiative, aggression, uh, sex drive, uh, you know, just it, it is the way in which you move through the world and you accomplish things, you get stuff done. Um, so mars in scorpio is a very interesting one because it has a lot of staying power scorpio is a fixed sign and scorpio often represents uh secrets intense experiences uh deep uncovering of those secrets it's exploratory often you'll see this in the the charts of like detectives investigative journalists things like that and it fits well with this sort of like you know philosopher sagittarian like let's dig in let's figure this out let's get deep into what's going on right here um and it's also interesting that you have this in the third house so the third house is this line right here and the third house represents teaching communication uh publishing but it's really more like like short form periodic serial publishing so like the podcast that you're doing uh right now for instance is a great example of the third house and yeah it's also a interest in sort of like more spiritual topics more deep topics the unknown the uh the hidden the unfathomable depths of things so you can look at these three parts of the chart and we haven't even looked at the rest of it but we can say yes like you are a thoughtful detail oriented person who is interested in exploring the truth you will tend to do so through a medium that perhaps involves travel or uh international relations sometimes uh and you will want to go very very deep into these topics as well and 
the interesting thing about Pluto Mars is there may be kind of like a compulsive aspect to it because Pluto has a signification of obsession, of need, of survival. So there, there can be an element to the personality where when you decide to do something, you have to do it. Like it is life or death inside of yourself is how it can feel. Like it's this compulsive need to just go and do something. Um, that That's typically how Pluto will show up in some way, or it's a way in which you can, uh, yeah, you don't shy away from the dark and intense uh, things in life as uh, maybe is saying. So then we can move on to, did, you know, did Venus. Pluto, can I ask yes. questions? Yeah. Did Pluto show up in here? Yeah, Pluto is right here. This is the glyph for Pluto. So you have uh -huh. what's called a conjunction and uh, a conjunction is when the energies or sort of meanings of the two planets combine in a very strong way and they essentially become kind of like one super planet i guess you could call it uh the closer they are the more they act together and their their needs and their desires cannot be separated as cleanly so mm -hmm. another thing that i haven't pointed out yet is you know you have your moon and your mercury together so the moon is how you feel safe how you feel comforted uh how you react to things automatically and instinctively and so sagittarius is very much like okay well let's find the truth or let's you know uh do something powerful about this because it's a it's a fire sign but with mercury there mercury is how you process information catalog information learn information and also disseminate it so the way of communication will tend to be very playful very um you know expressive very enthusiastic it's a fire sign uh, sort of thing but you've got this mixture of mars here in your third house which also has to do with communication so it tempers it a little bit your virgo ascendant also tempers it a little bit you're a little bit more thoughtful if you had a like a, a sagittarius ascendant with all that sag you would be just this crazy <laughs> crazy very very playful super expressive person most likely um so the other piece is you also have mercury conjunct your moon and because of that that'll tend to make the way in which you react to things automatically is to process intellectually like when you receive new information, when new stuff happens, it's to think about it. it. You know, the the feeling and emotional center and the logical center are very much coupled and pulled together, essentially, is how I would read that. Um, let's see. So moving on to Venus. So Venus and Capricorn. Uh, Venus and Capricorn. Venus is all about how you receive love. It's all about how you enjoy being adulated or being... Uh, you know, cared for or, uh, you know, adored, essentially. Like, Venus is the sign that says, pay attention to me, you know, love me. And so um, Venus in Capricorn tends to be a little bit more uh, reserved. It can keep people at a distance. It can, uh, it, in a way, it demands people to prove that they love you. Like, they have to earn it, in a way. That's a very common uh, Venus Capricorn thing. Um, and more commonly this um uh, that that's one possible motivation i want to say that's like how venus and capricorn works but a common dynamic with venus and capricorn is that you can go a very long time between relationships because you want somebody who's there who shows that they mean it who shows that they really care about you and that they're kind of there for the long haul uh or there for you know something substantial it also will tend to not too long i hope <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's not gonna be too long with all of the sagittarius you have you know you don't want to be tied down too much but you want somebody who's like firm you know you you can feel them there uh and, and like they they have a, a tangibility you know that's all those earth sign things so you probably also really enjoy you know physical touch is probably a, a decently high love language for you uh or acts of service is also very very capricorn yeah exactly cap venus wants somebody people to put in the work um and uh mm. yeah so also as holy weather is pointing out yeah someone with a taste for intense conversations definitely uh mars pluto in the third house and then finally we have the 11th house which is also very funny so uh you have jupiter there in cancer and jupiter in cancer often is kind of a nurturing figure they, they want to take care of somebody um it brings this energy that desire that really enjoys helping people 
uh, in some way or another. But it's particularly, I said, it's funny because it's in the 11th house and the 11th house is all about communities. It's all about like social clubs. It's all about people. And, you know, you, you literally run a podcast, Twitch stream, interview kind of deal for the people, by the people. Like it's all very, very uh, community oriented. Um, and then you also have Chiron there. And I don't know Chiron so well, but Chiron is, I mean, I don't work with it a ton, but Chiron is this planet that represents the the wounded healer. And it often represents a part of the self that is not like, cannot really be fixed. It can't really be healed. It is a source of learning and education. And so Chiron in the 11th means that you've probably experienced something in life related to groups of people, communities of people, friend groups, et cetera, et cetera, that may have, you know, harmed you or made you feel wounded in some way that, that you work through in life, in your experience. Uh, and this can often be kind of like a very background sort of thing because it's often related to deep rooted forms of trauma. Um, so I won't, you know, like, I can't say too much about that because I just don't know. Like, uh, you'll find that much of the time, like what I'm doing right now, is a uh, essentially a party trick. Like I'm saying a bunch of the traditional meanings, but the mm -hmm. way in which you should do astrology for a natal reading is to talk back and forth to identify the major dynamics and the personality and, and what exactly is happening there. Um, and you know what issues somebody might have or where they can apply further forms of leverage, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'll take a little break before I move on to the outer planets, but how, what do you think so far? How's this reading? So, yeah, I took a couple notes. I, I literally, so here's the philosopher in me. It's like I wanted to turn your thing into just a sequence of, of propositions and then rate them, like, uh, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, this is, so let me think for a second. Because I have these notes here. I'll think out loud. I have these notes yeah, here. Yeah, and just, just so you know, like, yeah. when I do these sorts of readings, my expected accuracy rate is, like, about 70%. Like, that. that's about roughly what I, I tend to get right. Yeah. So, I'll just go ahead and say, I'm, I'm not trying to, like, so, <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, and if I'm totally off, that's also... No, 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 no. It, no, it's pretty right. It just sounds okay. pretty right. And then I have these other voices in my head being like, nah, dude, this shit's fake. <laughs> but I'm going to just go ahead and say it, it sounds right. So the Sagittarius stuff, yes. Some of it was interesting in that it sounds right for me now, mm -hmm. but hasn't been in the past, So, mm -hmm. which is a little weird. So with relationships, pretty much since I was like 19, I was just in relationships in sequence until... Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, and, and I, in between relationships were like at most a couple of months. And then mm -hmm. uh, the longest I've been single is, is actually now. I mean, it's been like a year or two or something. I mm -hmm. fucking don't even ask me. Um, it's been a bit. Uh, but that, so that was interesting. The thing mm -hmm. about, I guess it's interesting when I'm thinking about the romantic stuff. The thing about the kind of like shit testing that's kind of fucking real i've gotten that feedback before um <laughs> about being like kind of hard on people um the pluto mars thing yeah the thing it made me think of was not philosophy per se but but i have like a mystical streak um mm -hmm. yep. and i pray a lot and i do and I'm, i i think of that as like a source of guidance and knowledge and mm -hmm. um so you're talking about secrets and sort of dark intense things um mm -hmm. i kind of ha had an obsession with pain when i was you know pain and fear was like a thing i was obsessed with yeah that is um, such a pluto mars scorpio story dude like like you, you, sorry keep going but like yeah the, the fact that you say that just blows me away because i'm like yep that that is exactly that placement that is what that talks about you know uh, uh -huh. but yeah please go on yeah that's i mean what else did you say the um the playfulness in communication is interesting because this is a, also a tension in my life because, mm -hmm. I mean, okay, so obviously a bunch of it kind of read the channel, you know, the, the thing we're doing now. Mm -hmm. um, and, but the tension in my life has been a little bit between this, like, am I, honestly, this is kind of like a career question. Am I more of an entertainer or am I, am I more of an intellectual? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I don't know, fuck it. It's philosophers playing flight yeah. simulator. So let's look at So yeah. that is a great point for me to pour some whiskey and let's get into it. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. Uh, also, we so, got, we got a lot of chat happening and I, I feel like I'm missing it cause I'm thinking about the, like, you know, my soul and shit, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, pl chat, please be insistent if, if you desperately mm -hmm. want us to look at something cause like this, it tends to suck you in. Um, yeah. People are just making 
different observations and we got a lot of people know about astrology in the chat apparently yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah no but we keep going yeah okay so the way so for instance the way in which you might uh look at and it's funny because i actually literally have this book with me at this very moment oh wait y'all can't see me huh um <laughs> one sec let's see oh yeah let me let me look at the north north node but yeah i literally have this book uh by me uh it's like a handbook of how you might decide oh i want this career or that career um but anyways hmm. excuse me so vocational guidance um, by astrology yeah so uh you won't you won't really be able to get any uh, value out of that. I just wanted to, sh like, if you're not versed in astrology already, but um, essentially it's kind of like a guide in, you know, different ways you can look at vocation or career, etc. So traditionally, the way you would do this is you would start by looking at uh, a number of factors. So one of the key ones is the midheaven. Um, it is the highest point in the sky at the time of your birth. So it essentially represents the thing that is most visible and the thing that you put into the universe and into the world, essentially. So when you have this uh, placement, I mean, everybody has the placement, but you look at it and you're like, okay, well, what is that related to? So one of the things we can look at is that it's in Taurus and the ruler of Taurus is Venus. So your job the thing that you put out there into the world that you're known for i don't want to say it's just career because it's more than that it's often the thing that you become known for it's kind of like your legacy and contribution to the world will be venusian in nature so related to arts to entertainment hmm. uh in the fifth house which is also related to things that you create so you'll be making these things you know um and so th this is your personal output which will tend to be artistic um and will tend to be something capricorn -y, which can mean either like you are literally building architecture or something like that or uh could mean you are just the way in which you approach it is capricorn which is very steady uh solid work towards a goal and an achievement and kind of like building an empire like capricorn is very much like an empire building kind of sign um so the other thing is you look at though is you also look at the sun and you look at the moon uh because those are kind of key personality drivers as well as virgo so the sun and moon being in sagittarius is it's always going to have this sort of like truth seeking philosophical thoughtful bent and you can't really get away from it that's going to be there no matter what um and so i i suggest you embrace that and you've also got you know mercury right there so i mean honestly michael it's it's a stuff that's a lot like what you're doing now it's a blend of these things it's a blend of the philosophical of the entertaining of the joyful of the aesthetic you know like you've literally created a space for us all to hang out in where we can go over a beautiful sky and live there for a little bit and just talk about high-minded topics and exist in that space you know like you're you're living your chart right now in this moment which is just wild to me because like and this is why i do this because you you see it all over the chart um and the other piece of course is always going to be about communication it's about going to be pushing stuff out into the world uh like you know communications media writings etc with that pluto mars there and you're going to want to tend to explore these dark dark deeper topics as well so like if there's any part of you that maybe you're not bringing forward yet and i haven't seen enough of uh you know philosophers play flight sim and i apologize for that but like if you haven't pushed much of this out there yet this could be another part another way in which to to live your chart um but i, I will also say that you know these things are lower in the horizon so you'll tend to be a little bit more secretive or a little bit more reclusive with them like symbolically speaking they are the lowest point in the sky for you at the time of your birth and so they uh will probably manifest that way too where you you might be a little less comfortable expressing these sides of, or components of your personality or you might you know never do it in the public sphere and that's also totally fine but like the impulses that drive you to the things that you will create will lead from from both directions um and oftentimes like mars will often rule career as well so don't ignore it and the the impulses that it gives you it's yeah it's interesting you're saying it's cool that it has this like below the horizon is secret because i do think a lot about how people have secret sides mm -hmm. right yeah that's, that's... yeah so it's interesting because the the uh all the houses the fourth eighth and twelfth houses 
traditionally associated with water signs have to do with often emotions and things that are more hidden. Um, right. The fourth house is actually where you were. Uh, it's like your family. It's the things you're sentimental about. It's the things you feel about um, that are like very, very deep within yourself, often from childhood. So it's likely that a key part of your identity in some way, if uh, and we do have the birth chart correct here, um, it's likely that, you know, your family or your upbringing or your memory or your childhood is a source of inspiration for you with the sun there or uh, a source of like motivation or there's things that you're still figuring out about where you came from uh and your your own upbringing and past experiences that's the fourth house's significations um whereas the eighth house is the house of <clears throat> this is a fun one it's literally the death and taxes house okay. uh, it rules death regeneration other people's property it also rules like uh inheritances that you get from your family um it rules like like trauma deep hidden things like it like it is the scorpio house it's very intense very plutonic very dark very kind of heavy um and what's interesting is that your eighth house ruler uh, your eighth house is in aries it's there with pluto your eighth house ruler is mars so mars is that secret uh, planet for you. Mars is the the driver of all that force assisted by Pluto. And uh, the 12th house, finally, is the house of it's it's many things as well. All the, the all these water houses tend to be like that. But essentially, it has to do with healing, Christ consciousness, disillusion, uh, as in dissolving things, uh, releasing things. It has to do with death it has to do with healing but it also has to do with things that are hidden and sometimes when i'll look at a chart i'll see that somebody has like the moon in the 12th house or the sun or mercury in the 12th house and I'll, I'll usually be able to tell them or ask them like hey do you feel like people don't understand you or like they misinterpret you or they look over you and oftentimes it's true because it's literally the house of hidden things hmm. so when you are when an important placement is there like your sun or your moon you tend to be hidden from the world or from other people or they don't like grok you they just can't perceive you in the way that you you should be by default you know um and it, it's interesting because you can kind of construct these narratives based on the shapes of the chart so if you have a bunch of stuff in the bottom house like you do then you will tend to be more inner motivated you will have resources and energies and and needs that are driven by your your internal dynamics of your personality and things that you need to solve where if whereas if you have things that are up front you'll tend to be more oriented to the outside world to other people to you know things that come in and how you engage with them and you know you'll notice that all of your stuff is down here except for your jupiter and your chiron so in a way like jupiter the way in which you expand and grow is in public like this is that's what you're super doing fucking right now. true that's yeah, super yeah. true to the Absolutely, extent yeah. to the extent that i this is going to sound a little bit crazy but please um i often think that in order to grow as a person i have to do something in public and it's like yeah. i will sometimes put together communities and i will sometimes oh cool we got it um oh, yeah i guess yeah cool. uh, there we go perfect the i'm sometimes shocked at like how, so like if i want to learn about sociology I, I have to start a book group <laughs> it's like yeah. i can't i can't just do it by myself it's like stuff like that um yeah that that's jupiter like jupiter shows you yeah. where you uh um where you thrive essentially and where you uh grow as a person where you literally like jupiter rules expansion it rules beneficence like all these good things and it is uh it's something that you're gonna follow probably you know most of your life uh, because that's your jupiter placement so like that's kind of like how you thrive in this lifetime it's just completely wild um just to, just as a question right? <laughs> of it's super fucking wild um yeah. the it's interesting because the there's like an ontology here i don't know my thoughts are going but the yeah, um please. yeah let's let's go well so what do we I guess my mouse won't show, but um, if just as a matter of interpreting the chart, mm -hmm. so there's the colored rings, and then there's these symbols are along the inside of in, in the white. Yeah. Um, and then just give me just the simple like what are those again? Yeah, totally. Okay, so and sorry, I should have started with that, but basically, that's, that's, that's okay. there, yeah, there are a number of components to astrology. They are the planets, the signs, the planets are in and then the houses that the planets are in excuse me 
and then the aspects that are made between them. Uh, sort of a way, simple way to think about it is the planets represent the components of the personality, the houses, or sorry, the signs represent the ways in which those components are expressed, the houses represent the area of life that they tend to be expressed in, and then the aspects between the planets, which we actually haven't looked at yet for you, is the ways in which those expressions interact with one another. So when these are all aspects, essentially, so there's a number of aspects, and I, I put myself over the wheel, so let me move myself and double check that y'all can see this. Okay, let me put this uh, down here, because I'll just point out the aspects. Okay, that works fine. So the, the major aspects right here are these top five ones, and then you have a couple of minor ones, which are considered to have less of an impact uh, on, on people, I guess I'd say. Uh, so the conjunction is a zero degrees. So Mars and Pluto are conjunct. And if, and Moon and Mercury are conjunct as well. Opposition is 180 degrees. So you have an opposition between your Jupiter and your Neptune. Uh, trine is 120 degrees. So you have a trine between Chiron and your Pluto Mars. Uh, and then a square is 90 degrees. And you have a square between, let's see, you've got a square between, uh, the node and uh, your Pluto Mars conjunction as well. And then there's also some lesser known or more minor ones like the semi sextile. You have a semi sextile between your Pluto and your moon. Uh, and then a quincunx or a in conjunct is 150 degrees. And you have a in conjunct between your Chiron and your moon uh, as well. So essentially, you can view this as the network of energy of the components of your personality interacting in dynamic action. So when we look at these, we might say, oh, well, your Chiron is trining this important configuration of Pluto and Mars. And so the blue aspects are aspects that are considered flowing. They work together really well, um, but it's not always good. Like it's frequently uh, the, the amateur way to interpret all trying sextiles, et cetera, is like, oh, it's good, it's great, it's flowing. But, you know, I've seen in charts, like, people who are huge assholes have a lot of trines because it all just flows for them. Life is just one seeming, uh, like, just seamless flow, and they just go through life until they get obliterated by reality, which shows up at some point, because they have no internal conflict. They don't have any internal, like, struggles that would propel them to grow on their own before they encounter the real world. Whereas people who have tons of squares and, and whatnot uh, will have tend to have very difficult internal lives, but they grow a lot and they develop extreme strength as a relate uh, as a result of all of that. Um, so to actually read into this, so the red are essentially uh, harsh, and then the blue are flowing, and then the conjunction is considered kind of special because it's just like a pure combination of the two, and then the quincunx I also consider it to be harsh, even though it's green. Um, not sure why, uh, but anyways, mm. so <clears throat> with this Jupiter Neptune opposition, what's interesting is that, uh, Neptune is the planet of imagination and dreams and aspirations and things like that. It's like the, it's, it's related to film. It's related to fame. It's related to, uh, you know, the ideal best perfect thing that could ever be possible. And then you also have Saturn here conjunct Neptune and Saturn is a planet that represents kind of like the hardship, the restriction, the the lessons, the things that you have to do. Uh, that it's it's. I always use the metaphor for Saturn of, you know, it's not like investing in the stock market. You can't put ten bucks in and get a hundred bucks out out later. Uh, it's like going to your dad and mowing the lawn, and it gives you a dollar. And then you go to him again, and you mow the lawn, you get a dollar. You do a hundred times, and you get a hundred dollars back. It's one to one. It's hard work to output. That's what it is. So with Saturn and Neptune together. It's kind of weird uh, because it's almost like you are in in the role of bringing the intangible to form because Neptune is literally this planet that's so associated with not like it, it's all very vague. It's idealistic. It's fantastical. And Saturn is structure. It is strength. It is form. It is building. And so when you combine those two, you can end up with a scenario where either Neptune or Saturn can be stronger. One where you are like able to bring these things to fruition or sometimes you might be too hard on yourself because you are never quite able to live up to Neptune's expectations of the ideal dream and then Saturn's expectations of how well you should have executed that. And that's 
it's also both of these, this dynamic is in opposition to your Jupiter. So it's likely that when you are creating these spaces for communities and people in public, you're always trying to build the ideal space, the dream community, the dream sort of project. But you're, you're also like trying to work on it really hard. And there's this dynamic of like, oh, maybe this one, this isn't good enough. Maybe like I need to push this to the next level. I need to do this and that and that. Like that's Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, like all in direct opposition. And the crazy thing about the opposition is it cannot be resolved. Like you are only mm. ever going back and forth between those two energies of being like, yeah, I got this. This is Jupiter. Let's fucking do it. Uh, versus Neptune and Saturn, which are like, you know, this is the ultimate dream. Get it right. Uh, sort of, uh, sort of aspect. So yeah, it, it's it's really interesting because like, Jupiter clearly is playing a role in your chart in a big way for you. Uh, I think it's also exalted in Cancer, which is pretty sweet. Uh, just makes it extra strong. Um, and oh, that's also interesting because Jupiter, well. Sorry, I, I won't go too deep yet. Um, but yeah, so like that's an example of the opposition that I've seen. Let, let me just give you one reaction. So the yeah. bringing the intangible to light um, is definitely something I'm trying to do super mm -hmm. duper hard. And the way this manifests for me is one is philosophy. Two, two is, dude, like five ways. Philosophy is one. History is one. I literally have a, yeah. a blog post. Um, history is boring because you don't want to feel it. This is the blog post I wrote basically about how oh, yeah, yeah. It, there's a secret meaning, right? There is a meaning. Mm -hmm. In fact, I have, I am now remembering that one of the themes, so I, I have my Substack newsletter, I've written mm -hmm. like 20 newsletters. And in one of them, I said, uh, I'm trying to figure out what the theme is here to all this stuff. And I made a list of like nine posts that were all about how there is a secret meaning that we can apprehend. Um, nice. So philosophy, history, religiosity is one of them. Uh, virtue and social dynamics is another one that I'm that I'm super. Mm -hmm. So that that definitely resonated when you mentioned uh, this the bringing the intangible to light. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And cool. I mean, that's reflected there. You know, it's it's close to your Venus as well. Um, it's a little far for a conjunction, but it's in the same sign. So traditionally, you'd say they're related. Um, and like, let me point out something interesting to you as well. So let's go a, a level deeper. Uh, there's this idea of what are called uh, terms. So you have... Uh, each sign is essentially broken up into five of the different traditional non-luminary planets. And so when you're when you have a planet under that sign, it means they essentially kind of report to that planet. You also have a uh, so you have another level of relationship besides just the rulership of like, oh, you know, your fifth house is in Capricorn. The ruler is Saturn. So your Saturn is extra strong in the fifth house. Uh, I like terms a lot because they often reveal things. Like, for instance, you have uh, your midheaven under Saturn, so it reports to Saturn in its manifestation. So if I'm looking even deeper at your career, I'm like, okay, midheaven, the ruler of, is Venus. It's going to be something uh, artistic, aesthetic-related, something perhaps even sensual, something uh, that, that is about entertainment and joy, things like that. But then midheaven is also under Saturn's term, right here and saturn is with neptune under jupiter's term and then jupiter is where it is in your 11th house so you can kind of like follow the terms and see where they land and where does uh, jupiter land it also lands under venus and venus is under saturn's term so you now have a triangle that's being formed between your midheaven your jupiter and your saturn and your venus i guess it's really like it's connected to all of those so when you're talking about uh, a career sort of thing, you can look at the terms and be like, well, it's going to involve Venusian things, Jupiterian things, and then Saturn, Saturnian things, and also reflecting their locations and their placements as well. Uh, the MC is under Saturn because it is under uh, the, the sect, or sorry, not the sect, the uh, term right here. So the sign rulership is Venus, but the term rulership is Saturn. So yeah, this is pretty. So is it a mis? Is this a misinterpretation that like, well, so that there, so there are important parts and like kind of less important parts. Mm -hmm. But then, um, yeah. So yes. So so you know, I would say even to start to think about it, like um, 
if you consider people, people have more important parts and less important parts as well. Right. So it does resonate. And you also made this comment about how Venus is more uh, taciturn and reserved manifestations of Capricorn haven't really evolved until, you know, later on in life. So like there's two parts to it. One is that certain planets are stronger based on placement. So like your Saturn and Jupiter are both extra strong because Jupiter is in its sign of exaltation. Uh, which is just like each uh, traditional planet has an exaltation sign uh, where it feels extra powerful. And then your Saturn is dignified uh, by domicile. So it it is uh, the ruler of Capricorn. So it's in its home. So it's also extra strong. So you have this very strong pull between both Jupiter and Saturn. They're important planets for you. Um, and let's see. So Mars, I think, I don't have... I don't remember all of the exaltations, dignities, etc., because I don't like really need to have them memorized for the type of work that I do a lot of the time. But um, essentially, these two planets are very strong, and comparatively speaking, the other ones may not be as strong. But you know, like these personal planets always still matter. So like, it is very much also. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm starting to word word soup, word salad a little bit. Um, there are certain planets which are stronger than others, often dictated by their sign and whether or not they make any aspects to other planets. Um, and also sometimes their speed, whether or not they're retrograde, mm -hmm. whether or not they've uh, stationed retrograde, things like that. And so when what one thing that can happen is you can have a planet that's in a specific location of the chart where it's technically not related to any other planet. It's not making a strong enough aspect to any of them, or it's too far off. And we call that a, uh, a peregrine planet or like a lost wandering planet. And because it's not associated to any of other, the other planets, especially if it's not connected to the ascendant, the moon or the sun, then what can happen is that dynamic of the personality is not integrated. So for instance, a peregrine Mars can represent that in the personality uh, this person may either be like very docile and not connected to their sense of aggression at all, mm. or they can be a person whose aggression is totally out of control because it's not calibrated with the rest of the chart. It's not calibrated with the rest of their personality. Like the types of people, you know, like you, you know, people like this one who like would never defend themselves, would never uh, put up for themselves. And then people who just like go off at a moment's notice for like no reason. Uh, like that could be described by a Peregrine Mars, um, not just, but that's just one example of how those sorts of things can be read. Um, do you read anything into empty houses? Uh, so <clears throat> for me, it typically means that that area of life just won't be as emphasized throughout the entire life. But when you're looking at transits, planets will always activate the houses that they enter into. So even though, you know, Michael has like an empty second house, whenever he has Jupiter enter there or, uh, you know, the sun or Venus or anything like that, um, then the, the second house things will be activated. So it'll also be like, if I'm looking at this, it'll say, oh, the second, something enters the second house, it will be associated with the Venus ruler. So it's likely that when a transit happens to the second house, uh, Michael will also have a, Michael will have a, uh, like a financial event or some sort of property or ownership event because that's what the second house rules and it'll likely be related to his venus and his fifth house matters so like for you because uh michael because venus rules your second house the way in which goods accumulations property etc tend to come to you will be related to venusian topics of um re you know relaxation joy entertainment love lust sexuality things like that like um i don't know an example might be like oh you know you're somebody else i might read saying like oh they have a massage parlor or something like that so right. it's related to like their money like that's how they one of the ways they make money um because otherwise you might look at the second house and if you just say oh a second house means nothing happens there that means that this person has no money like they don't ever own anything you know which isn't uh just doesn't happen so it's just reduced emphasis um, but can still get triggered by very big events. Like even if you have a totally empty second house, if you get a Pluto transit there or a Saturn transit there, like watch out, like hold on to your shit basically for my French. So do you, do you personally think that it's significant? Um, not just at the life level, but like at years and months and weeks and days, or do you, mm -hmm. or do you say some of these, uh, 
So do you have a personal kind of take? It depends how closely you look. So like for me, I when I'm looking at financial astrology, I am looking at the level of days, uh, sometimes hours. Uh, there have been moments like in crypto, I was looking at Dogecoin and it made a very significant like move to to within like 15 minutes of an aspect I was looking at. And I was just like, what the hell? So like it can go really, really deep. Uh, there's even a book um, by this woman. I forget what it's called, but it's essentially about how to gamble with astrology. And she has the hmm. system that's devised on gambling for four minutes a day. And she's like, this is your sweet spot. This is your lucky wow. time of the day based on transits to your ascendant or, or the way the, the ascendant moves. And so she's like, yeah, go to the slots every day and write down when you hit it big and then every day after that it's probably going to move by four minutes and then there you know there's certain times that are more lucky overall etc cetera, etc cetera. and yeah as uh as multi's pointing out there's also like uh, planetary rulers of each day and each hour but those tend to be more uh esoteric and more for like magical usage but you can also use them as elections for deciding when to do things uh they're less predictive they're more like actions you would take um so yeah, I mean, honestly, as deep as you can get enough detailed information on, you mm -hmm. could theoretically go. Like, it's all up for study. I do have some ideas about, like, markets shifting intraday or maybe gambling, things like that that are related to the movement of the Ascendant and maybe which planet gets activated. But it's not something I've studied and certainly not something I've studied enough to put money on, you know, on those sorts of timescales. Right. Yes. Deep. <laughs> this is wild. The... Uh... I, I, I find myself growing like kind of like I think it's a little bit the whiskey and a little bit like foggy headed or something and, and this yeah. happens with kind of psychological stuff um, mm -hmm. it's just super reliably for me um, the it's very it's a lot to sort of process um, it is and there's yep. a lot to it's very interesting I, mean, I just find myself wanting to think about it I'm like <laughs>